From TMP to TTNG For sure the cure and those tired meme jeans Hella can sell and the promise ring Sunny day real estate and rights this spring Prince Twinkle Daddy's help keep the dream alive I constantly thank God for Algernon and Remo Christie front drive Mineral snowing high tide hotel year and more Rio Limo only consists of the DC emotive hardcore Episode 56 of the E-Word Podcast. This is Kyle, as always, here in Madison, Wisconsin, joined by Ellie in Austin, Texas. Ellie, what's up? Uh, I Yesterday, I experienced a debit card fraud for the first time. I got my my stolen identity uh, cherry popped. And I the like the problem is I like I'm one of those like insufferable motherfuckers who like doesn't use a bank, they use a credit union. It's located in Las Vegas. And so I had to cancel my card, obviously, but if I am not in Las Vegas and able to, like, get to a branch to pick it up personally, they're going to send it through the mail, and that's going to take, like, 10 business days. But also our mail just, like, has not been showing up. Like, it was my birthday last week, and everyone's cards, like, have have failed to show up. So I am worried that uh, if I got a new debit card through the mail, it would just be swiped, and then I'd be in the situation all over again. But I'm doing really well. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing all right. I'm experiencing my first weekend, which is a Monday and Tuesday. It's kind of kind of weird. The the real like mind blower is like the Wednesday Thursday weekend, because everyone's talking about how excited they are for Friday <laughs> and <laughs> that's your Monday. <laughs> that's your Monday. Yeah. Uh, well, instead of hogging some time, we'll get to our guest here, and that's Tim Crisp from the Better Yet Podcast uh, Network, I guess, at this point. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Ellie. Oh, I've just been sitting on my hands the last three minutes. I mean, debit <laughs> card fraud, the mail, weekends. I mean, I feel like I have so much to contribute, but I don't want to. I don't want to get in the way of the flow. <laughs> weekends are strange. Debit card fraud, awful. The mail, we need it. I feel Thanks like for having we have me been... on, though. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's, a, that's an important thing to say. Thank you so much for having me. I feel um, quite excited to be on this podcast in particular. All right. That's great. Big fan. Tim, we actually met each other twice in the same spot this year. It was like February, right? Yeah, I was telling my partner that, that it was really funny that Kyle and I met twice within a couple of weeks of each other. During a year when I can't really think of too many other people that I met. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of a that's it's kind of a mind fuck. <laughs> mm-hmm. In that strange little uh, like German dining hall on the <laughs> University of Wisconsin campus, very very cool vibe that y'all had there and then yeah there was that fiddlehead show and then i think i was back a couple weeks later for uh rat boys and that was february and march and here we are i think i've met like three new people since then (laughs) yeah it was weird because like 2020 was such a gonna be and was already like a pretty busy concert season like i saw a lot of good shows in like a very small amount of time and like 
Like, mm-hmm. I saw 100 Gex, They Might Be Giants, Fiddlehead, Frail Body. Wilco was my last show. That was, like, the day before everything shut down. It was supposed to keep going, but, like, it went out on such a high note for me. <laughs> I'm so resentful that you saw 100 Gex. Like I, I want to say it might like at, at at this point it was like their final show that they have that they had played. Yeah, that, that sound that sounds right because they were only like a couple weeks away from hitting up Texas when yeah. everything got shut down. But I thought we'd we'd start off by doing like a proper vibe check because I feel like on our two episodes since we've come back we've just kind of rushed through all of our life updates and stuff. Um, and Ellie, you've like kind of semi properly announced that you're writing two books. Yeah, yeah, I did a, a Facebook post and a Twitter tweet, which is about the most promotion I do now. Should I get an Instagram? I'm going to open the floor. Is that <laughs> is that something that I should do only like only in the interest of self-promotion, like only in a self-serving capacity? <laughs> I, I think it's fucked up how like some people will completely miss some, something on Twitter because they didn't see it on Twitter or Facebook and they only rely on Instagram and vice versa. So I don't know. They're all annoying. That's the thing. Yeah. I, I like Twitter because it's really easy to make people yell at me. But <laughs> Facebook, yeah. you get those. You, Facebook, you have those longer comments and people engage with nuance and it's just disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if, if we do need to vote for does Ellie need an Instagram, I would vote mm, no. I would right. vote no as well. I just I just took Instagram off my phone. I didn't like delete my account, but I signed out of it for good. I don't know the password. I don't really care for Instagram and I just noticed how many ads I was starting to see. So that like kind of mm. messed me up. But I did make a Finsta so that I could like follow band shit because I I did feel like I was kind of missing out on like band updates because not everybody's too active on twitter yeah but then do you find yourself spending too much time on it on instagram i still don't honestly and i mean i think the the main reason was that i wanted my partner likes to use instagram and she likes to she likes to send me uh dms of funny things and i i didn't like not having the dms of the funny things so that was the reason number one for the Instagram and then two was like, oh, I guess I'm like missing out on like some band stuff. So let me follow some band accounts. But then I like still haven't used it for like five days. Yeah, my my partner scrolls through her Instagram like next to me in bed like every night before we go to sleep. And one thing that I've noticed is that there's like a, a, a huge preponderance of like educational PowerPoints basically yeah um but all done by like the most smug insufferable types of people that you could ever meet like there was one <laughs> that was like we should stop using the term billionaire because it is classist and <laughs> <laughs> i think that one in particular ended up being satire but it was like indistinguishable from uh people who were against the the use of the word rural that's a like that's like a true thing. That's like a true PowerPoint that I saw on Instagram. Well, it's important that we have these conversations while um, fascists try to take over our government. Um, hmm. You know, <laughs> so let's focus on as as fa- <laughs> yeah as fascists <laughs> are trying. Um, yeah, but, yeah, I guess that was. Let me. Um, I'd like to apologize uh, for my my misuse of. I think the progressive uh verb tense there but while fascists have taken over again uh you know i was just i wasn't really thinking as it was coming out i'm working on getting a little bit better with that that was a perfect notes app apology yeah i was just gonna say <laughs> we're, 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 we're gonna need that in uh notes app form yeah. <laughs> i'm going to take this time to listen and learn and uh hopefully next time uh my grammar will just be a little bit better um <laughs> Anything uh, we, else for we, this weird vibe check? We legit lost followers because I made a Ruth Bader Ginsburg joke. Like, yeah, who needs them? The yeah, followers. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, uh, do, do we want to talk about the clusterfuck that, that's been happening since uh, RIPRBG? Um, because the new Chapo Trap House isn't out yet, so I honestly uh, don't have any opinion. 
I'm cool with I'm cool with uh, skipping it this round. Oh, okay. I feel like I'm I'm at a point with um, a lot of this stuff where it's it's honestly becoming so much that it's hard for me to just like experience uh, things in real time at this point because we're we're coming up to you know what is supposed to be like a you know an important date um, in November and. I think thinking ahead of like the possibilities of what could or would or should happen have been kind of bogging me down a little bit lately, which is like a tough feeling to to sit with. I think was it, when you're, you know, obviously every, we're all trying to stay like very present and on top of things, but there's a certain amount of like day to day like hour to hour like news that is just making it real tough for me lately and i don't know if it's like good or bad to like disengage a little bit but i'm feeling like i have to i don't know if either you feel that or it's just so hard to like keep up because it's really easy to just get into like a cycle of like you know the domino effect of everything I, yeah, I mean, like, it starts to feel like emotional self-abuse for me when I'm just, like, reading through, like, my Facebook feed and seeing, like, all the news headlines. It's just, like, I, I feel like I can't disengage from it. Like, I'm, like, physically unable to, like, pull myself away from the, the, the train wreck, but it, I think it does actually have, like, a very adverse effect on my mental health. <laughs> yeah, I, I was doing, like, sprints of, like like refreshing all the news pages like multiple times a day and then just like bumming myself out and then you know disconnect from it and then shit gets worse and then locally it gets worse yeah it's tough it's like I, yeah i don't i don't know i've been um trying to sort of check out and then get like a like a quick like five minutes during the night and then I mean, even still, I feel like all of the just, like, pent-up, like, emotion just, like, knocks me over. Like, when, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, I'd, I'd done a pretty good job of, like, not engaging with the news all day. And then I heard that at, like, 7 o'clock, and I just said, I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that went from like, okay, oh my god, this is happening, and then I was like, but nothing can happen, right? And then it's like, no, the, they're rushing to make something happen. And then it was yeah. just like, everything bad that could happen will happen. Well, I just bought a house <laughs> in uh, Valparaiso, <laughs> Indiana. Um, it's uh, where we're, my partner and I are moving to Trump land on Saturday. Um Actually, we're moving to Valparaiso. It's a pretty cool town. There's a small university there. Um, so the the Republican and Democrat uh, demographics in 2018 were pretty close, like 50% to 49% in uh, Porter County. Uh, it leaned Republican. And the house that we moved into, there was a motherfucking MAGA hat in the closet. So I do feel very good about the fact that we are, like, kicking these motherfuckers out and replacing their votes with Democrat votes. So I, I do feel positively about that. Got some sage to burn before we, like, move all our shit in, though. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, congrats. Thank you. Congrats. Uh, something extremely unnerving that happened to me over my birthday weekend was me and Dino went down to Port Aransas to like stay in a cheap motel and hang out uh, on on a beach like very far away from people. Um, but as we were driving back from the beach, uh, we started noticing all these trucks with like huge Trump make America great again and like Texas flag and like uh, don't tread on me flags like sticking out the back of their truck. And it turns out that um, the town we that you drive through to get to Port Aransas, Corpus Christi, that's like a huge like Trump town. Like you you drive in and there's like three Make America Great Again billboards. Um, but we we were driving 
back from the beach next to a, an enormous parade of at least 100 Trump supporters that had driven down from Corpus Christi and maybe other places in Texas. And uh, <laughs> D- Dina has like a Warren sticker on her car. And <laughs> I was wearing my my race trader shirt, which has like a defeat white supremacy emblazoned in enormous letters on the back. And uh, that was a that was a very unnerving time. Um, it was like a full like 30 minutes of just driving next and in front of and behind all of these uh, people with, you know, fucking like the one blue stripe on the American flag, Blue Lives Matter sticker and shit on their cars. Mm. Um, yeah, just but luckily no- nothing happened. I think that if we had like engaged with them, something might have happened. But we just kind of uh, stared straight ahead. It's it's one of those things that just makes me think about like how I think a, a stereotype that a lot of uh, people in our bubble have is that Trump supporters are like the like poor white trash. But all these people had really nice, expensive trucks and traveled like down an hour or two hours uh, to to come to this this beach. So these are people who like have money and are in positions of power who are in, invested in in Trump's presidency. And that's always a it's always a sobering reminder. Well, how do we pivot out of this? <laughs> Dude, this that thing? is seriously a great question, and it's one that I'm like I think still putting together as I do podcasts again is like how how do you like check in with your friends and y- you can't like gloss over anything cuz it's everything it yeah. just feels so heavy right now but i think that like that is a really good uh point to take from that story ellie is that it's definitely not all one type of person that is on the other side of things and like going back to like facebook and twitter and and instagram i think that that's been like that's disconnected me from a lot of uh dialogue on the left is you just see a lot of a lot of people who really don't want to like ask the questions about people who are on the other side because i think that that's something that is tough to do is to just like take a look at it and also like examine yourself a little bit and examine yourself honestly because i mean we're all uh we're all sharing this space, although I find it very hard to, like, relate to anybody who would, like, vote for that person. You know you know where they're at. I mean, just as, like, a human who observes things, you can understand, like, what people are thinking. Not to, like, uh, not to, like, make I don't a, even not know to, what I'm saying, you know? I, Sorry. I, I feel like I know where you're going with this. Like, mm-hmm. not to like make apologies for or mm-hmm. express or, or like sympathize for, but you know, to to just to understand where it's coming from structurally. Like, and I feel like that's a that's a problem that a lot of like the left has right now. Uh, like, in regards to class consciousness, I think that there's like been an increasing like friction between. Uh, people who are entirely about, uh, you know, like li- garden variety liberals who are concerned mm-hmm. with like very superficial surface level, uh, like quote unquote representation that doesn't actually uh, participate in any sort of socioeconomic uplift. Yeah. And then on the other side, people who are asking questions about how we have come to this point. And Jack had been published this, uh, this review of a movie that like analyzes like the incel subculture and basically the point of the review is that we need to look at like these young men and like the complete lack of socioeconomic prospects uh resulting from the 2007 to 2008 crash and you know consider the fact that economic struggle uh makes people much more vulnerable to adopting reactionary attitudes Mm -hmm. and all the comments are just like um it's I, I, they're just innately shit. These people. Yeah. Yeah. 
do you think the lazy assessment is like it's just like the generational divide and like when all the boomers die it's going to be like mostly liberal and liberal leading people um that's a good question um i pay a lot of attention to like teenagers like teenage culture um because i i think that like the way that they deeply intertwine irony and earnestness is like really fascinating and i think it's uh when they become the dominant generation, I think they're going to produce some really cool art. But one thing that I noticed is that they're extremely politically polarized. Like half of all the Zoomers are commies, and then the other half are like actively trying to start race wars. That's no good either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People will say, well, where do they learn to be racist? And then their parents. I, we're coming up on it like, I, I think okay, not coming up on, I think we actually are like living in this generation where there is a significant amount of parents who have children who are virulently racist and have no idea how to deal with it. I wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. So I feel like, I feel like my participation in these discussions just always like brings us into another sphere of like <laughs> contemplating <laughs> the end of the world. So yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay, so I guess if we if we have to move on from this from this section, the the final takeaway I think people should have with regards to the most current events is that a um, the Democratic establishment uh, is very weak and has mounted no opposition to b what is assuredly going to happen that no fascist has ever been uh, displaced with votes. Um, so there's, there's going to have to be some, some feet on the ground in the near future, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Tim, you have earned yourself some plugs at the top here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> better yet is back online and tell us about everything else that you have done since, uh, basically the spring. Yeah. Well, I stopped doing better yet at the end of 2019 and I took a kind of examination of myself and, and what I was doing with my time. Um, and from that, I started a podcast with Brennan Kelly of Lawrence Arms, uh, one of my favorite bands. And Brendan is a uh, very, very smart, very good talker. And I came to him with the idea of just doing a podcast about all the records that he's done. We were doing one album per episode for the first few weeks and then did that. We started doing that in February and then things started to crash and then we started doing it over Zoom, which turned out to be for the podcast it it was a nice change because it kind of just allowed us to go a little bit longer with the episodes and talk a little bit more, flesh things out a little bit more, but in the beginning, we were doing like, you know, two hour episodes and then we started doing Zoom and we were doing like three hour episodes. And I was like, let's just start breaking this up. <laughs> um, and those are albums they... that you I feel like you can't really successfully cover everything in two hours, too. Yeah, definitely not, especially some of the like later material, because it's very you know, greatest story ever told has a footnote section with like a <laughs> yeah. reading list yeah. and all all this fucking uh there are a couple Slava files, so there's a lot of shit that they're referencing and yeah, we've um it's kind of just like morphed into a, a couple hours uh a week talking about however many songs we can on one of his records, uh whether it be the Lawrence Arms or the Falcon or his solo material. And they had a record come out in July called Skeleton Coast. It was very good. And what happened with the idea was that it turned into just like kind of a bit of marketing for the record was to get people like engaged with Lawrence Arms material. And then the record release came out. Um, and that was like, I think beneficial. I think it, I think it did them a, a good service and then I did a podcast uh, called uh, Life's Work, which is a podcast about Laura Stevenson's second record, Sit Resist, 
Don Giovanni just uh, had it remastered at Abbey Road Studios, and yeah, that pod was a hit. Yeah, was it? I don't know. And I, whatever, <laughs> like, I don't know when people are uh, listening or not listening. It's really hard to gauge with this sort of stuff. But I, I saw some peeps getting stoked on it on my on my timeline, which rarely happens for any podcast. So yeah, well, that's cool. Yeah. Just good, I really like it was a really it. good pop. Yeah, I mean, oh, thank the you. people that you talk to are like the people that I've followed since I was like a teenager, like Gethard, Rosenstock. Et yeah, those were yeah. those were two wild interviews to to do at the beginning of quarantine. I tell you what, <laughs> Gethard is definitely like one of my all time favorite comedians. I love him and Kyle Kinane have like such a cool background in punk and. Mm-hmm. I really mm-hmm. like the like the DIY hardcore to comedy pipeline, like Tim and Eric, for example. Yeah. Um, anyway, Tim, I have a I have a very serious Lawrence Arms question. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking as someone who, the first time I ever heard them was Apathy and Exhaustion, and mm-hmm. as like a twelve year old who was like really into Day Beggars, of course it spoke to me. Um, <laughs> but my my very serious life or death question about the Lawrence Arms is: Is it true that Brendan Kelly is the person who runs the nihilist Arby's Twitter account? That is true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That is a, an rumors, open but, fact. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I never knew. Thank you for clearing that up. I have a question about the Lawrence Arms stuff. Yes. I, I am curious because you know Lawrence Arms goes back to punk news, and punk news goes back to asshole commenters. Uh, mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you get that? And do and do like people like you from that comment <laughs> world? Do people like you <laughs> because like Kyle, as you know, everybody likes me. Yeah, um, I think that there is definitely a through line of people um, who who like graduated from like the punk news comment section. It's interesting because I, I I read punk news a lot and. I never really engaged with the comments too much. I feel like I lucked out on on that end because Punk News is, when I look back on it, it was really like a great website that collected yeah. a lot of stuff. Although it does have like bro sort of uh, cut off shirt sleeves, uh, two-fisted beer drinking kind of crowd. Yeah. Um, I think I see the, I think I see a link there but I think that, like most things uh, involving the internet, I feel like a lot of that shit has been toned down, like with the times. I think that punk news is a pretty interesting document in terms of the progress that we've made and we've continued to make from the very like male centric, heteronormative crowd that dominates all everything um <laughs> but in punk specifically like there were those essays that lauren denizio wrote and katie crutchfield wrote yeah. about sexism mm. in punk and i remember that was a big thing back then and the pushback was huge but also feel like it was a it was a big pushback that also was like a pendulum swing the other way because I felt like a lot of things became a lot more open after that. And that's obviously like, that's my perspective as a, you know, straight white dude. Um, But I feel like there were a lot of bands, especially like in like 2010, I think of a reviver and how their Mm. like queerness was such a big part of their identity. Yeah. And that was a bristly thing then, but also within a couple years, like Reviver had really like taken up everybody who was not pushing back. And you saw a lot more people coming in identifying with this band just yeah. based off their identity politics. And that was cool. 100%. Yeah. One thing I will say for the, for the punk news forums is that back in the day when you were looking for new music i got no better recommendations for like melodic punk than the punk news comments and the nothing nice to say forums which were Mm. like deeply intertwined communities too Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, those days of like reading punk news and like 
everything was on media fire yeah it was that was a really cool time where you could just go spend a couple of hours and then just spend the next two and a half days just listening to all the demos that you downloaded oh yeah yeah <laughs> I I decided to um, start doing Barriette again. Um, <laughs> oh right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to I had to make that mental note uh, a few minutes ago. Um, I have a I have a way of being very uh, roundabout about everything. I'm trying to get better at it. Um, well, welcome to the E word. <laughs> and tangents don't exist. <laughs> it's all it's all one shape. Yeah, so I, I I decided to to bring Better Yet back. I realized that I missed doing it a lot, and I also realized that a lot of people were having a really hard time talking about uh, the new music that they were making and releasing. And I think that I identified very much with. First of all, I I always want to hear new music, especially from like people who whose uh, careers I've been following. But also, you talk about an industry that has taken such an economic hit during this year, and, you know, these these people have new music uh, that they were planning on uh, touring around, and they can't do that. And then, you know, we're all, we're all in this very very difficult time of struggle and sharing music in this time has been really really tedious for a lot of people um so i wanted to bring better yet back as a way to like talk to people that i miss and also give them a chance to talk about their music and so we started doing a revenue share with our patreon where the revenue split three ways each month equally between myself, the guests, and then an organization that the guests and I talk about each week. So with that, it gives us another reason to like come together and something to share with people each week. And also, I guess, just a, a way for us to, you know, have a discussion that feels like, you know, tough at times because mm -hmm. it's just like you know constantly like there are more important things in the world than my music right now and i get that so let's let's bring this part in we can we can work for something better and also like please just tell us everything that you want to say without holding back and i think that you released your like september lineup with namdi adult mom illuminati hotties and I could tell that all three of those people have a lot to say right now. <laughs> Most certainly do. Anything else you want to plug? No, that's it. All right. That's, I'm sorry. That's, I, I, I sweat when I plug things, so... <laughs> 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 Moving on. We usually, like... Good night, everybody. <laughs> we... <laughs> Our episodes got so long that it felt so rude to leave the plugs at the end that we had to put them at the beginning. Yes. This one's 42 Good minutes in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, happy to bring back this segment. What have you been listening to? Um, I think last time I was like, I haven't listened to anything. Uh, I actually sat down and forced myself to listen to stuff, and I have a lot that I've been listening to. So I'm going to start off. I don't know how this happened, but like I had never done a Patreon in my life. I've never been a patron to something, uh, but Cloud Nothings is an all-time favorite band of mine, and they were doing a Patreon where they were giving uh, people a unique album each month, and they've done two so far, and they're two awesome Cloud Nothings releases that, though they are like bedroom-made, they're still cloud nothings releases and it's been great um i finally checked out that band carpool from new york they put out mm -hmm. an album this summer finally got to that it's great it's hooky this is gonna be just like an acrobat unstable plug section because they they have released three really fucking great albums in the summertime uh ultimate frisbee is a it's like a mathy emo band from spain that's really fucking good too. And then they put out that Common Sage record, which is pretty good. I'm not seeing 
too many emo people talking about it, but it's fantastic. Uh, Barely Civil put out their second full length. Uh, Chris Teddy produced it. It sounds huge. Um, I think I like the first album more at this point, uh, but this one charted on Billboard or something like that I saw, so that's wild. Um, Top Shelf put out this Del Paxton EP that I dig a lot. I thought it kind of sounded like equal parts college rock and emo, which was tight. And then, for some reason yesterday, I was like listening to Blink-182 and I was trying to put myself through the exercise of, am I a Mark or am I a Tom <laughs> a guy? I came to the boring conclusion of, you don't get Blink-182 without Mark and Tom. That's what happened mm. with that. Boring <laughs> result. Speaking as a complete and total Mark, I think, Kyle, that you are, uh, you are Travis Barker. No, I'm a Scott. <laughs> oh, I mean, but I mean, like, you, you're, you're Travis because you're still consistently doing this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tim, of course, is the Matt Skiba. <laughs> that would be me. Oh my God! As you were a podcast about Alkaline Trio. Wait, how did that Tuesday, not get? How did that not get brought up? <laughs> I don't know. Can we edit that back in? I don't think that David's going to be listening to this, but um... no, David, David live. Tw- Live texts me uh, his reactions to our episodes. <laughs> oh my god, how did? That's amazing. He doesn't. He doesn't text me anything live or not live. Oh, we're we're like really good buddies ever since I was like in freshman year of college. Like he's been like following my blogs and stuff. So hell yeah, I'm, I'm a really big I'm a really big David fan. One of my me mentors too. and idols. David is the fucking best. Like, so cool and so smart. Always so down to talk about literally anything. David, Mm -hmm. if you are uh, about to text me, I love you. (laughs) David, I love you too. And uh, I I wouldn't be doing anything that I do if it weren't for David. David texted me um, probably half an hour after I posted the first ever episode of Better Yet. And we, I don't think we'd even met in person. And he was just like, hey, I think this is really great. And uh, I hope you keep doing it. And let me know if you need anything. And boy, did I, did I take him up on that last part. <laughs> <laughs> He's the best. I love him. I think I found out about David when he was on 100 Words or Less, the Ray Harkins podcast. And he was talking about Tenement. Mm. And I was like, oh, what? There's a journalist that knows about Tenement. And... Then I followed him since. David knows everything. David does I've, know everything. I've never texted him about a band and had him say, oh, I've never heard of them. I got to check them out. It's always like, oh, my, my personal favorite is the second seven inch. But, you know, you do you. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, can you accurately guess the only three Patreons that I support? Uh, Blink-155, Chapo. No, I've never, I've never, ever supported Chapo. You can get all their premium episodes for free and i refuse to give them money i can't tell if that's sarcasm or not they 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 already have so much they get they have like one hundred and thirty thousand a year on patreon so christ okay but was i right with blink 155 correct one out of three are okay are they all podcasts uh two out of the three are podcasts is yeah but still one of them oh no no does red scare have a patreon they do, but Red Scare's evil. <laughs> what? I guess Dosh is cool, but Anna is, like, the worst. <laughs> Especially on Twitter. <laughs> Wait, Red Scare, not not the record label. Oh, no. No, no, no. no. <laughs> There's no oh, pot. okay. I was like, hey. <laughs> Come on, dudes. Joseph McCarthy's Red Scare was also evil, just to be clear. That is... Um, <laughs> thanks for clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> I don't Any more hot wait. takes about the 50s? Does Cumtown have a podcast? Definitely also do not support Cumtown. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I don't so, know you as well. Oh, uh, so it's Blink-155, Axe to Grind, and Hate 5-6. I, I don't know why I didn't think of Axe to Grind. I support I, Axe to Grind. I love the Pat Kindlin Podcast Network. Uh, Tim, this could be off the record, but does Blink-155 not approve of As You Were? This can be on the record. We totally stole blink 185 um or blink 155 uh that idea we listened to the first couple episodes of it when it came out and 
we didn't really like it. I, I've heard that it's much better or it got much better. But I think in the very beginning, there was a little bit of like a, uh, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to be too disparaging. Um, although I despair, I have been disparaging on as you were, but that's more of a bit, but yeah, the, the first couple of episodes of that show had a little bit of like a, uh, incel vibe, I thought, but oh, I've no. heard that, I've heard that <laughs> some of the people that were on the episodes that I listened to didn't stay on the episode. But we definitely kept up. I like to do a bit on As You Were and on Road to the Skeleton Coast, too. Um, I like wrestling so much that I can't, like, not be a little bit of a heel character. Um, so we definitely came on with As You Were just being like, oh, that that podcast, they stole our idea. <laughs> like, whatever. But I don't I don't know. I've never spoken to any of them personally. And like it was very clear um, pretty quickly that they turned that thing into something really, really good. And like seeing some of the organization work that they've done uh, oh, yeah. the past mm -hmm. few months has been super, super inspiring. So all love. Yeah, uh, I have uh, a friend who who is, like, pretty good friends with Josiah from Blink-155. Mm -hmm. And I have it on pretty good authority that any beef from their end is, like, 99.9% .9 ironic. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, we've never, like, really, like, discussed it with them. Um, I think it was, it was just like, yeah, screw these guys. Why not? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... I would be terrified if they had any beef with me, not me personally, but just like any beef because you can't tell the nation that you can't do something because oh the, God, the nation <laughs> just rides too hard. And also because Josiah is just too good of a shit poster. He called Vampire Weekend a New York hardcore band. You cannot top that. <laughs> <laughs> you really love that bit. <laughs> I do. I really do. <laughs> also, I think David and I are, like, very... We're not active on Twitter, really. He certainly isn't, and I go through, like, bouts with it. Um, but, like, the As You Were Twitter is pretty inactive. So I think when we were a little bit more active on Twitter, we would get, like, interactions with people who would, like, try to stoke that flame. And, and I don't know if I was, like at work and in a bad mood i'd just be like yeah whatever fuck those guys but i didn't mean it <laughs> so tim what have you been listening to lately i've been i've been listening to a lot of smog lately which has mm. been great red apple falls whenever the one with the uh let's move out to the country with the blue cover i'm bad with like album titles um but yeah i've been like really liking smog records just like in thinking about doing the exact thing that is described in the song that i just mentioned also like a lot of van pelt i don't know if either of you are yeah van pelt i'm fans. i'm i'm a van pelt stan i fucking love that band so much um and i'd say every couple of years it's just sultans of sentiment and it's usually like I listened to the first two songs on Sultan of Sentiment like a few times over, just like pretending that it's like a, a seven inch. Also, Stealing from Our Favorite Fe Thieves is such a fucking good record and kind of underrated, I think. All their stuff also, is underrated. They're also ex Native Nod who are like criminally mm -hmm. underrated. Yeah, that band and like the, the family tree of that band is for some reason I think has like never gotten. A real renaissance. And yeah, I don't have, understand why. Have you heard Ted Leo's hardcore band, Citizens Arrest? I have. They're so good. They are. I, I like Ted Leo. Is it, a, is it a hot take to say that Hearts of Oak is the best Ted Leo album? Mm, no. No? I, yeah, that's a pretty standard that's take? A okay, take. good. Yeah. Okay, good. I, I only have so many hot takes I'm allowed to dispense per episode. <laughs> <laughs> I've also been, there's a new um, Slouse and Malone record that just came out. Slouse and Malone comes from that, like, 
lo-fi New York hip hop scene mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. like Mike and um, all those. He put out a record um, that's got a really weird and like long title. It's like for gang and it's it looks German, but it also looks fake. But he made a record called <laughs> A Quiet Farewell last year that I loved. And this new one's like nine songs. It's very like low down really sad shit um a very good hip hop producer and i i've been really into this label called thrilling living from kansas city they got a band on there that i like a lot called special interest that's like kind of no wave um they did cb radio gorgeous and this dope seven inch that i really like called sniffany in the nits that's like <laughs> pretty like Proto punk, yeah, super into that shit. Um, just uh, on like like bouncing off of uh, the Sloss and Malone bit. Um, there's a uh, like if you dig him, you'd probably dig this other artist, uh, Navy Blue. Um, Yo, and, Navy uh, Blue is so sick. Yeah, that kid was like straight up just like a skater who just decided to start making music, and it's like what a tribe called Quest would have been if they were born like 20 years later. Mm-hmm. I think that that scene is like really really interesting to me. That whole like lo-fi oh, sure. yeah. New York, yeah. It's like the anti six nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Anything else you've been listening to? I'm like putting off mine because I know it's always like annoyingly long. Oh, um, <laughs> there's this band called the Doughboys from the '90s. Hell I, yeah! Yeah, I think they're from Halifax. Um, I just interviewed Mark Palm for Better Yet. Mark's in the band Super Crush, and oh, yeah. he made a uh, he made a playlist fans. for our uh, for our Patreon that um, had like you know if you listen to Super Crush, it had the Super Crush uh, like influences that you'd expect, uh, like Matthew Sweet, uh, the birds sugar for sure and um and then doughboys were a band that i'd like heard but hadn't listened to and that record crush that they did in 93 is so fucking good blows my mind is the new super crush out yet i remember seeing it comes out on october 8th on don giovanni records oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah so that was cool talking to Mar- mark was fucking awesome because that dude is a lifer and i am such a fan of those super crush all the seven inches when that band came out it was like fucking the best thing that i'd ever heard yeah and lp's really good so that's it for me that's what i had written down um i just did a uh it, it still doesn't come out till friday but i did a um a song premiere for Pretty Maddie. Um, Hell yeah. Yeah, which is... It, I I listened to their new song. It's called You're Not There. Uh, it'll probably be out by the time this podcast's out, but it's, like, unreal good. Like, just super sticky sweet power pop from former hardcore kids. But, uh, so as, as uh, a lot of people who listen to the podcast may know, currently working on four books. Uh, the main one that I'm working on is... Uh, an analysis of the longstanding impact and legacy of the 90s hardcore and emo scene. I'm doing research on the one hand, so I I did like a quick reread of Jason Heller's Fear of a Punk Decade, which is one of my favorite columns the AV Club has ever done, and been listening to a lot of stuff from that. And then I also have been locking down some interviews for the book. Um, I'm going to interview Javier from 18 Visions, which is a Whoa. dream come true for me. <laughs> Whoa. Um, and I am going to interview Corey Von Bolen, who is the uh, brother of Davey Von Bolen. And we were talking like a 90s hardcore group, and he started giving me like all of these hardcore bands that the Promise Ring dudes were in before the Promise Ring. And I knew of a couple of them, but they go way back. And like almost all of their bands, except for Captain Jazz and Ten Boy Summer, are like hardcore that goes hard. So I've been listening to. Seal a Shrine, Demise, uh, and Drawback, and None Left Standing, who are all really good, like, 90s-style hardcore bands with, like, a tinge of that desperate emotional 
like emo vocals and also for the for like the kids who are into like gulch and stuff like that listen to this band animal farm who in 1994 put out this uh this ep called you cannot call this piece and it still sounds like super fresh and heavy today it's like insanely heavy um and the fact that it came out in 1994 blows my mind but i know that if kids these days picked it up they would they would fall in love with it i think that's everything i i tried to dive through it real quick sick oh also i'm i'm doing a an essay for my newsletter this week about how, why insomniac is the most underrated green day album <laughs> mm, hard agree with you on that it's not my personal favorite that's kerplunk but um, mm. I think that no one ever gives Insomniac enough credit because it's their most punk album yeah. and it's their second for a major label. It's like 20 times more punk than any of the stuff they did on Lookout. <laughs> Is Warning anyone's favorite Green Day album? Is there like a warning corner of the internet? There I is. Think that there it, is. Yeah. Okay. It was my favorite in like seventh grade when I was like going through my insufferable just discovered pet sounds and. Uh, the Kinks phase. Well, there's the fucking Kinks <laughs> ripoff song. Yeah, a warning. Yeah, warning. Um, <laughs> it's the song it's ripping out the picture book, right? Yeah, yeah. And then American Idiot is Double Whiskey, Coke, No Ice. And uh, 21st Century Breakdown is uh, just everything about Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> <laughs> Oi, we're gonna do some topics and some questions. I wanted to ask you, Tim, what is your current relationship with emo because it seems like all of those tim bands are non-emo bands that uh pal around with emo bands like rap boys and meat wave and etc yeah I, that's an interesting observation i think that i love emo i love i also feel like i'm just i think of everything as punk and i think that like the shit that that you just pointed to, Rap Boys and and Meat Wave, definitely comes from like the same sort of DIY touring, basement show space. Those two bands have kind of graduated from that, but you can still very much feel their roots, even with like Rap Boys who are like making a indie rock play at this point. So I haven't heard I haven't heard like much emo anything that's like come out like branded as emo in the last couple of years that like really really grabbed me. I think I've found a lot of it to be very interesting, but I think that I'm always like down for sure. So yeah, I guess that's my like real non-answer of an answer <laughs> but you're not like actively keeping up with like the new wave of emo bands like stars hollow or nice or origami angel or does that stuff just kind of hit you when it hits you see I, I i heard i haven't heard those first two bands i've heard the origami okay. angel record and i thought it was good i heard the short fictions record and i thought that was good that one and... was, I, yeah because that one's like very literary and very lyrical so i feel like that makes sense mm -hmm. that you would uh dig that one totally i think that like god it's interesting like the the phase of emo that we're in right now because i feel like a lot of that stuff sort of came around the same time that like punk news was really big there was that there were these sets of like uh emo scenes that were coming around at at that time chicago was one of them uh the lehigh valley uh mm. had another and it was interesting to see like a lot of those bands um either they did one record and they were gone or they like kind of expanded out into i'm thinking of like Glockamora basically just like to me Glockamora and Spirit of the Beehive are are like Songs Ohio and Magnolia Electric Company, you know? It's <laughs> it's just like the it's just the say it's the same thread that's just been evolving and the name change just like made sense at a certain point. Yeah. 
when it when I like first was hearing like emo bands again, it was like emo is fucking back, and it never felt like it went away. So I I think that like the the wave of like younger bands was exciting, but also I was like, huh, are we like what phase are we in right now? You know what I mean? <laughs> We're in emo revival revival. Oh okay, hell yeah! All right, I'm down for it. <laughs> But does it even sound like what you were listening to in 2011? No, and that's kind of why it's exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people have the opposite of no, and that's why it sucks. Yeah, well, it is It is music for younger people. Yeah, That is something that I will say and not in a, like, disparaging way. But if I heard, like, Algernon right now for the first time i think i would like it but i wouldn't like i wouldn't be like making an excuse to go in the car and like scream along to it yeah see i think what we've come to on this podcast is that half these bands just need to suck it up and call themselves pop punk because that's what it is mm-hmm. mm. or indie rock yeah if you're like the post-rock band just just call yourself an indie band if you See, call yourself bummer punk, you just break up. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's like an interesting aspect to all of it because I feel like I feel like there are emo bands that came out in 2010 that were definitely punk bands. Then there are bands now who wouldn't go anywhere near the term punk. Maybe they'll call themselves emo bands. What do you say about that? I guess Midwest bands in particular who were like, for example, if you were like a punk band that was on top shelf, you were an emo band and that's mm -hmm. not fair. Yeah. I mean, Rap Boys definitely has like well, yeah, Rap Boys the emo attachment because they're on top shelf. Yeah. That's weird. I don't know. I, I feel like nobody should call themselves indie rock anymore. I feel like that's <laughs> a terrible distinction to make for yourself because it's basically just saying because that you're uh, all the all the flagship indie rock bands are major label bands now <laughs> i mean yeah that's the time that we're in right like the national is the biggest band in the world yeah and i think that's because there's no like it's it's kind of taken the place of what just rock and roll was yeah or alternative <laughs> um modern rock mm -hmm. <laughs> coming at you x107.5 <laughs> Yeah, but it's never been like it's it I think it's still considered indie rock cuz it's never like it's never transitioned into radio and that's cuz there is no radio anymore. Like right, the last the last big radio band was like fucking like Nickelback or uh whatever the Adam Levine Maroon 5, that's what it is. But yeah, indie rock is like a fucking major industry filled with a lot of awful shit. It's just like, you know, classified as indie rock so that people can feel smarter about it. That's kind of happening on a level where like the the scene that the E word more or less exists in is known as just DIY and like mm -hmm. anything from Screamo to like pseudo ska can exist. And uh, we just call it DIY for some reason. And I think that sucks because DIY meant something completely different like five years ago even it just meant that you were a band that books your own tours it's a weird development like i feel like you know the whole female fronted is not a genre thing could also apply to diy at this point it's not a genre yeah. it's just supposed to be a general approach um but at the same time um i mean i like there have just been several periods throughout the the scene's history where like all the different like musical styles were just considered part of one scene and i do think it's like the scene is always a bit more productive and inspired when it's like that rather than every when everything gets like uh atomized yeah it, it's like it's interesting the way it's kind of developed um from i think of like the the SUNY Purchase scene and then like the bands that were in like the original 
epoch of like you know eskimo or like gabby's world fka eskimo bellows uh told slant all right. of those quarterbacks were mm-hmm. mm, quarterbacks yeah they were doing their own recordings and they were you know it was then it was like bedroom pop and and now bedroom pop is like a whole other label altogether yeah but i think it like refers to the same thing um which is like oh like you made this recording at home using garage band well that like might be true but at the same time that's like become an open source like approach to things that like someone's home recording for their first ep that distinction is maybe like giving a little bit more credit to like what it actually is now because anybody can do that and i think that like diy yes it is like anybody can do this but there's a whole laundry list of like what that used to mean that doesn't really happen anymore because now it's like you make an ep and then you hire a publicist and then you put your first record out on sub pop and that's called diy mm -hmm. so that's not really that's not really like on the ground diy they're not all those people like book their own shows book their own tours hosted bands like all of that shit that to they're me not... has always been diy <laughs> yeah they're not in the shit it's stolen valor mm -hmm. it is stolen valor there is no there is no other acceptable term yes. to <laughs> stolen valor for what it's not an it. overstatement whatsoever <laughs> but yeah i i think that like i think that any music that's like done on a scale that is booking your own tours like Recording shit with your friends, putting your own shit out, putting your shit out with your friends' labels. Like, that to me is is DIY, and that's also to me, like, punk. Mm -hmm. So it, anything that's, like, existing in that world is something that I'm going to be paying attention to. And I think that, like, the bands that I've seen, like, you know, Short Fictions and Origami Angel, like, that shit happened, and I didn't even, like, know it was going on until it was, like there and i was like oh cool this is like a very self-sustaining world that i'm suddenly becoming aware of how did this happen that's what's exciting that's kind of the dream for me at this point because i'm so overwhelmed by it all happening i would rather just have it uh come across my my desk <laughs> when it's there <laughs> instead of like eight weeks of everyone tweeting about it yeah that really became like the norm very quickly and i feel like this time though we're in has really had a lot of people stop and say like man music can be really unfun when we approach it this way i feel like i feel like i'm i'm hearing from more people that there is like a desire to just like want what your like worlds are to just be what they are it doesn't have to be anything bigger than like enough to like make it all happen and that's how mm -hmm. that's like you know that's shit that you got to build yourself and there's there's so many bands and there's so many people in like different places who can organize it and i think that when shows start to come back it's going to be a lot more of like i don't know i'm excited for like shows that i just like go to because they're happening not because it's one band with like one support act for the tour and no locals one local maybe you know there's like worries that uh like entry level booking agent bands are now going to be like trying to play like house shows and stuff like that and like that's gonna just like co-op the whole house circuit who even knows if that's a real thing to worry about yeah that's like a there's so many like question marks it's so hard to know what it's all gonna look like mm -hmm. but can't really like predict anything imagine a world in which like house shows have to get venue insurance <laughs> <laughs> my next topic is is it true that you podcast full-time 
has nothing to do with what we just talked about. <laughs> it, that's that's partially true. I, okay. I podcast full time while I I run a a very productive unemployment scam. So, <laughs> uh, without without um the latter, I I would not be able to say that I do the former. <laughs> I don't know if I heard that on your podcast or you tweeted it or something, but yeah, I was just curious how you would pay your bills with podcast money. Yeah, well, I pay, I pay my bills with podcast money plus a little bit of uh, of government money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah! I, I'm I'm working on um, I'm working on doing it as a full time thing, having three that i'm doing at once is definitely like the minimum amount that i like could be doing it at i mean this is like part of the reason that i stopped doing better yet in december was because i lost my job in october i had a major abdominal surgery and like fucked my body up i was super depressed so i ended up losing my job and went on unemployment and then all this like covid shit happened at like right around the time that i was like gonna come off unemployment and i was like well that's uh that's mighty nice and that was like kind of around the time too when i was just like you know what like i, I tried to get like copywriter jobs shit like that i can't get a real job i don't know how to do it so i figured try to like go all in on this as all in as i can and see where it leads who knows where um but like for the time being it's like at least been it's been giving me like enough to like contribute to you know the home that I share and take care of the dogs and uh, buy a record every once in a while. I don't know. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm better at this than I am at anything else. I'm definitely not going to like ride it out until, you know, come hell or high water. Also getting a job right now is like fucking difficult, mm -hmm. especially because I only know how to do manual labor. I only know how to like work at coffee shops. I, so we'll see what happens with yeah. it. Right now, it's sort of just like making do with where we're at, and maybe one day, maybe one day, I won't need to uh, be running a, a side hustle, whether it be scamming from the government or like working a day job. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, like I was thinking, like, like what you did for the Laura podcast, like, is that like a model that you can do for someone else who's got a record coming out or a some kind of campaign coming out you know because like the laura podcast was like so cohesive and like honestly it was like a huge step up and stuff that you've done just like creating like a narrative and stuff like that you know yes. what i mean yes i can do that for any record that is coming out <laughs> better yet podcast at gmail.com <laughs> um <laughs> yo that laura podcast took like that was a full-time gig and it was so fun and it was so rewarding. I th the hope in doing something like that was that like yeah, polyvinyl. You want to put something? <laughs> you want to reissue something? Hit me up. I know. Uh, I know exactly how long it'll take me at this point. Yeah, I would love to be able to do stuff like that. I feel like there's a lot to be done with getting people excited about music that is different from what uh people are doing to yeah. get people excited about music right now because i don't give a shit about a song premiere <laughs> or even sorry like... ellie i know that you just you just <laughs> like you know what i'm saying i know what you're saying i get it uh it's okay because the only people who read music journalism nowadays are other music journalists <laughs> that's very Facts. true mm -hmm. <laughs> It's, uh, it's honestly like eerie, like eerie, like how similar the situation that you described is similar to my current situation, Tim. Like, mm. like down to the fucking letter. Like even, like knowing that if I, I'm in this like gray zone now where I 
either I can like make it happen or not, and I don't know how to do anything else. But there is a Starbucks within walking distance of me, so when all else fails. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think that this is like, I'm I'm sure that you and I probably had similar debates internally uh, about what to do with it, and it's like, yeah, th that could be those unemployment checks could be the like thing that you sit on could, while you like yeah, send like, resume out to change or, your life yeah or it could be like the thing that you need to take a like big leap yeah i feel so fucking extremely lucky and privileged about it too like to the point where i am like almost ashamed <laughs> but i mean you do what you gotta do yeah don't let that don't let that shit get to you because that's that's the worst like Ronald Reagan is not like your psyche. Ronald, like the the <laughs> idea that, that all of this shit is like anything other than made up is absurd. You know, like this country is two hundred and fifty years old. Like big fucking deal. Like, yeah. <laughs> and and I think the same thing about like, you know, the like music, DIY, Twitter. We've been doing it this way for like literally five years it feels like it's like set that this is how it is now but it's really just been going on for like five years um i guess this can kind of snowball into the bigger topic of like how do you get people to pay for your podcast and for your content like the e-word has talked about doing a patreon but i think we kind of ended up on the fact that we can hardly even commit to putting out regular episodes on a schedule yes. <laughs> that we'd have to record like two episodes a week to like make a patreon i think like worth the money yeah you know i i i don't know i think i i definitely lucked out with doing road to the skeleton coast with brendan he's definitely like the name on the marquee and having him be the like main draw and the patreon something that we split is something that I have very little influence on other than being the uh, person who says the website every week on the podcast. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. The idea that I had with the revenue share is that if we're paying out to the guests each week, that means that the guests have incentive themselves to say, hey, there's a cool thing over here. You should sign up. That means that they'll get paid more. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know of another show that's doing that. So the like proof of concept with with better yet and getting people to sign up for it, this would be it or not. So it is tough though. It is tough to get people to sign up for something that they usually get for free. Mm -hmm. Means that they have to go out of their way to do that and they have to care enough and trust you enough to make it worth their time and one thing that podcasts have that i think musicians are struggling with right now is is podcasts have always been free you've been all you've always been able to like download these for free and listen to them like on your own time and records started out as something that you had to pay for and now it's in this weird state where you pay for spotify and then you have access to all the records so they might as well be free but every financial push that musicians make i think are it's still attached to that pay model of well you sell records and then you get paid for the records that you sell I think starting from this is available for free if you like it enough and you want to support it here's how you can do it I feel like that's I don't know if it's like an advantage but it is a very I, I think the approach of doing it that way has its benefits yeah I've never thought of it that way that like albums and podcasts are now in the same like economic system basically um to kind of extend that thought that like now we are seeing bands doing patreons because like now all that existing free content is now suggested that you pay for it 
and I'm curious to see how that's working. Because, like, even Mike Kinsella has a Patreon where he's, like, doing covers and uh, mm -hmm. playthroughs and tabs and stuff like that. When that stuff would just go straight to YouTube. Totally. I think that that's a good thing. I do, too. Um, yeah. These all, these people should all just be paid, like, to live. <laughs> like, it, I think that... And, and Ellie, I'm sure you can attest to this, too. Like, having a a subsidy for you to work creatively it it has for me really just changed my uh, entire thinking i'm able to put 100 percent of my creative thought into just doing this thing when it's not booking interviews around like my work that's such a like substantial advantage that comes just from like not having to worry about money and it's it, it sucks that like bands don't make enough money just on their records to live it's so fucked up so the fact that they're like using patreon as like a model for like oh here's like cool shit that that like you can sign up for like here's what you get from it but there's like band patreons that i sign up for and it's just like here just here's money each month like you don't even have to like give me anything i just want you to be able to like wake up and write songs because yeah. that's what you're best at that's what you are when you're able to put 100 percent of yourself into that the songs are going to probably be better 100 percent. i i think that like you know that's like a that's like an idea that's not it, it it's expressed in a lot of different ways and i think that bands like just stepping into it and like taking fucking uh advantage of their reach to do that without having any like you know label that they depend on for shit that's always a good thing yeah I agree. I guess some of that stuff is going to be bookmarked for the Kanye discussion. I think. Yeah, <laughs> I was. I just. I just had that thought too. <laughs> so, I want to talk about podcast longevity because, I mean, I think both the E word and Better Yet has taken hiatuses and breaks and stuff like that. And I've also put it on a timeline and thought like, okay, we both have started podcasts while all these other podcasts kind of started and fizzled out mm -hmm. um and i was and i and i kind of broke it down to think like okay maybe this whole stopping and starting thing has helped with longevity and helps us keep going uh yeah totally and i mean the last time was was definitely like i didn't think i was gonna be doing it anymore and that was like reason number one like my dog chloe dying was like that was it i was just like i think within like a day and a half i was just like ah, i don't think i'm gonna do this anymore and that was also like mid-december and when you do a show that books guests who are on tour january february is is the worst time because mm -hmm. nobody's touring during that time so it was kind of like the idea of like coming back and and not having chloe there to greet everybody was just like i can't even like stomach that and then also what am i gonna like go back into like the most depressing time of the year <laughs> like <laughs> without my fucking dog like no way so i was i was done but like doing the like podcast with brendan was like oh cool i could do these interviews like over the internet and it's a lot easier to book them because i'm not booking around like all right cool so your plan tomorrow night uh you load in at six do you want to come over here at four cool i'll be ready for you to be here at four cool see you later that shit was so tiring so yeah the the break definitely helped with just like having me realize that like oh i could totally do this thing completely different from the way that i was but yeah, like it's it's a fucking long haul. You have to 
you don't have to do it anyway, but if you want it to be something that people are like paying attention to, you have to do it weekly. And that's fucking tough. But you got that means you gotta go on vacation. Like, what are you gonna do? You gotta book around it? That's stressful. <laughs> so yeah, like I mean you should everybody should be taking breaks from everything. But yeah, people love starting podcasts and people <laughs> including me. Including me, because it's just like, oh yeah, let's do a wrestling podcast. That would be fun. Four weeks later, this is fucking not fun. All right, well, <laughs> I kind of see why it happens, though, because it's like people's first podcast. They're all jazzed about it, and then they like, but they don't know how it works. They don't know it. Like, you have to edit these things. You have to fucking schedule them. You have to actually get guests. You have to convince people to listen to them too. And if people aren't listening, then you're always like, why the fuck are we doing it? Yeah, it's like doing open mic, but saying, I'm going to do my first open mic, and I'm going to do open mic the week after that, and the week after that, and the week after that. If that sounds, like, terrible, um, doing a, like, starting a podcast, kind of similar. Mm -hmm. Ellie, how do you feel about us and keeping motivated and stuff like that? I mean, I think a large part of it is that we kind of do episodes sparingly. Yeah. Like, it's almost like an event when we do it. Because when you think about other podcasts that have been around, like, about as long as we have, they the ones that didn't fizzle out have, like, 300 episodes. <laughs> and we have 56. And I think that in, in some regards, I think maybe that, like, kind of dampens how many people listen. Um because, like Tim said, there's the whole, like, you got to pump out an episode weekly if you really want people to care. But on the other end of it, I think it, you know, it helps keep things fresh. It helps keep us from, like, saying the same things over and over and over again. And, and also just for, like, so we don't have to, like, force episodes with, like, I don't know how to put it without sounding like, okay, now we don't just have to grab, like, our immediate friends to be our guests last minute because we have to have an episode oh, out this week. <laughs> you know what I mean, though? Like, Yeah, and I mean, maybe if, like, I, I mean, if we were going to do a Patreon model, I think we would start have to start doing episodes more that are just us because, but also, weirdly, isn't, like, an episode with just us, like, one of our best performing ones, the Hobo Johnson episode? Yeah, and I don't know why. Like, Maybe just because people were like, oh boy, someone else hating on Hobo Johnson. Um, you want to talk about the music industry, Tim? <laughs> boy, do I. I don't know how this happened. How is it that the music industry became the thing that we all want to talk about? We care about bands, and every band at every level is exploited. Mm-hmm. And we're just finding out about it now. <laughs> so i kind of frame this in the way that as someone who works in interviews with bands that have quote-unquote teams how do you suss out what is good and bad for this for example i personally love alex g i love all of his records and i like snail mail but i know that their careers are very manufactured and their futures are all planned out by people uh that are not alex g and snail mail those two examples, I think, are, are pretty interesting because I think that this is going to sound like I'm disparaging snail mail, and I and I don't mean it in a way that is personal in any way. I, I don't really care for those snail mail records. I I don't I don't hate them. I don't like have any like ill feelings towards them. I just don't like them very much, and. I think that what's different between Snail Mail and, and Alex G is that Alex G was just, like, making shit, like, nonstop. And I've always thought that his records are really, really interesting, and they're all different. And I feel like Alex G is someone that, like, his ascent, it probably would not have happened during a different time, but I think was on the merits of uh, the work. Yeah. And... I feel like Snail Mail just had an EP and then like suddenly it was like a very what's become a very familiar, you know, timeline of like Science of Sub Pop puts out a record, best new music, chores, all of that shit. And it it, it seemed 
to me, like there was just a succession of um, artists who followed the snail mail path. And there were some before, too. I mean, when you start to look at like all these people, they're all on like the same like major indie labels. They all have like the same like few publicity uh, firms. And it's just like, all right, none of these songs are exciting to me. I think that's what I go back to is like, there's all of this, like, all of this shit that's attached to it that seems to be very formulaic, but also, like, those songs just, like, did not really have any sort of impact on me. And I, f I just feel like I, d I didn't need to hear them. And I think that that's, like kind of a it, it's hard to not sound like it's hard to not sound like a dick when I say that you know but there's so much music so like why would I listen to something that I don't really feel like is doing anything that's like earth shattering to me when I, I could be listening to something that is more uh, impactful but Feel a little bit like glued to the timeline sometimes or if you're looking at the timeline it's all you're hearing about that week and it's like man they they got us <laughs> you know <laughs> they just got us i feel like i feel like the way that that i what what gets me um is when i when i realize that i'm thinking about something that i don't even interact with but I'm still thinking about it because I see it so much and I just take in like everyone's reactions and it all feels like I've been here before. <laughs> I think that's a really good way to put it because for example, I've never heard fucking Claro or Claro or whatever, but I feel like I know everything about them. Yeah. That just like happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's like mind control. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I think that like uh, there's it's it's tough because I, I, I'm sure that like both of you have had this experience of just like reading the description of someone's music. And it's like, oh, this is it's just so sad. It's just going to like it's just going to wreck you. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> no it's fucking not also can you talk about something else please just talk about literally anything that's like more interesting about what this person is doing than writing songs that are going to like emotionally destroy me <laughs> I got enough I got enough emotional destruction that I like take care of myself I don't I don't need this but you're telling me there's a different way to market a, a Bill Callahan record? <laughs> Yo, but Bill Callahan is, like, wild! He, like, <laughs> I that know. dude, I know. that dude makes cool music, and he has, uh, he has a, a wavelength that he's on, that when you catch it, it's just like, man, that dude has such a fucking funny way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. There's something to that, too, is, like, I don't see a lot of humor not to just harp on snail mail but we're using snail mail as like the example right and i, and I yeah, don't want to like the, I, the idea of snail mail rather than yeah. snail mail itself. <laughs> yeah totally i mean for for my example i use snail mail because it was like bedroom to coachella like instant mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. what i mean there's nothing funny happening on those right <laughs> there, and i i feel like that's like kind of an important piece to just like any like art that I want to interact with is like when there's humor involved that makes the emotional like weight of things mean more because your understanding of this person is is one that exists on a on a spectrum of emotion like the rest of us so in order to be sad you also have to be funny um and I feel like I kind of like one off on one a little bit there but th there i think that that's like a little bit of like a, a lifelessness that i 
that I feel in some of those records is is that they really seem to just be after one feeling. Isn't that like a like a truism of almost all art though? Like true comedy is like irrevocably tied to true tragedy. Like the the two are intertwined yeah. no matter what. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's well, that's uh fucking everybody's been everybody's been saying that shit since like I don't know, Elijah came down from the mountain or Hell yeah. You know, you'll pick one. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I like this note Kyle has. The E-word has never successfully booked anyone through a PR person before. Um, I just, uh, like, I wanted to vent again real quick about the manager of Foxing, like, coming onto my Twitter apropos of nothing, uh, just to be like, your podcast was mean to Foxing. <laughs> and, like, the thing that's, like, insane about it is it was, like, a thread that I made because I was feeling, like, insecure. I wanted people to say nice things about me. Um <laughs> And he, like, I, I assume, like, searched Near My God or follows Ian Cohen and mm-hmm. saw Ian Cohen talking about Near My God and my response and saying, well, maybe it's because the podcast Twitter said mean things about Near My God or called it ass. That's, like, verbatim what happened. So I didn't think anything of it at the time, but it's like a dick move to come into the the thread of someone you don't even follow and crash their hug box party right (laughs) yeah that is a move i don't i don't know i don't know where these fucking people come from and i feel like there are there are very good pr people out there jamie coletta helped me out with the better yet launch and she just did such great work with really just helping me get like the message that I wanted to get out out and clear and Jamie cares about shit and Mm. you can feel the love that she actually has for like music and the work that she does and you get a lot of people that are attached to bands that that do like need like management and like booking agents and pr those those aren't like inherently bad things but the type of person that you want to be your manager is like not the type of person that like want to like have come over to your house because they got like good weed and they like love love to hang out and watch king of the hill (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> a certain type of prick like fits that job a description. Type A personality. Yes. PR people and managers like fall into the category of either like complete and utter saintly angels or just the the most needle nosed dicks you've ever met in your life. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's and it's so easy to know what you're dealing with. Just don't even really need to talk to them. It's it's pretty easy to suss out like who's uh who's glad handing you. Like, do you get pitched for people for your podcast then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they're never they're never the good ones. It's always the most like bottom of the barrel shit <laughs> like like I might have like emailed you about uh about like again big thief on once and now I get like your your dog shit like just put an EP band out and you're like, hey buddy, <laughs> like what's going on? Glad to see Better Yet is back. If they even go that far, <laughs> like I was very consistent. I've been very consistently getting emails throughout the uh, time off that I had, which I found very funny. But yeah, I do get I do get pitches. One of them, I, I feel bad for. For saying the the band's name on the air because I didn't listen to their music, but they were called the Mooners, which I <laughs> I said like, you're the PR person, you should really discuss the band's name with them because <laughs> when I think of Mooners, I think of like me and my friends in uh, eighth grade like mooning a cop when we were <laughs> <laughs> out after curfew. I feel like pitching you would be interesting because it's like the podcast is basically whatever you like and like whatever reflect and it directly reflects your taste, you know? Yeah, it's it's kind of like 
Oh, we know you do a podcast. Um, would you be interested in covering this band? Um, and you can tell like who has listened to your shit before, yeah. just in the way that it's like presented, because it's a very like formulaic email. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times you just get something that's like, you know, would you be interested in doing coverage for this? And it's like, I don't, I don't do coverage i don't know what that means i feel like your version of coverage is uh uh starting out what their parents do and then what and then like going line by line with them on a song yeah which is like i i don't know i i feel like that's the best way to connect with someone is to just like start from like the thing that you liked first and yeah, like, I, I've been doing a little bit less of, like, the line-by-line stuff. I think that, like, with coming back with Better Yet, I'm still trying to, like, figure out the vibe a little bit. Because even though I've talked to people that I've already talked to, everybody's in pretty different places. And I'm in a different place, too. I think that Better Yet is still, like, figuring out its identity right now. Mm. Um, to me, it's always just been about connecting to people i'm like an introverted extrovert i needed to i needed to bring people to me in order to get to know them because outside i'm i'm very ill-equipped for just meeting people and conversing because i feel so strange at times at least in human interactions yeah i think that's how that's how kyle and i both are too like I, I I can't speak 100% for Kyle, but I know that I'm definitely, like, very socially anxious, like, whenever I'm not doing the podcast. This is, like, one of the few things that I'll, that allows me to, like, act like an extrovert and then uh, also not feel like I'm, like, exhausting myself at the same time. I can't even imagine what some of, or, like, what this podcast would be if it was, like, only me. Or if it was like only you, like how would it go? Cause yeah. I, 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 I feel like we're Blink-182. You can't have one without the other. <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that I'm Matt Skiba. Twinkle, 22. <laughs> but like for real, I, I like, I talked to my therapist about this like a few years ago where I just said like the only time that I'm like happy with interacting with people is when I'm at work. Because, you know, I work at a coffee shop and I I always found work to be a pretty ridiculous thing to do. So that was always where I put my like, you know, just kind of over the top, like silly energy into it. And like interacting with customers was just always like, to me, it felt like just like a three camera situation as comedy always. So I, Definitely that was like a solid a... Dillinger 4 reference, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> David will love that. It's his least favorite Dillinger 4 album, which is insane. But I guess, like, fucking Dillinger 4, you, one of them's got to be your least favorite. True. You know, being like a more like outgoing person is really easy when you're like standing very comfortably in your place. Yeah, that's kind of what the podcast has always been for me. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go into Kanye stuff? Uh, Yeah, if we we want to skip the newsletters topic. Yeah, because that could go on for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So the thing about the Kanye West tweets, um, one, like just from his latest tweets, I kind of feel like maybe he is like finally getting help, which is awesome. Uh, Like he apologized to Mace for that line in Devil in a New Dress. That's cool. But uh, he let off, like, a storm uh, yesterday about um, how, like, like the the way that he wants to, like, renegotiate contracts and, like, institute that change across the entire music industry, which, like, on the outset maybe sounds like typical Kanye megalomania, but the stuff that he was saying is actually generally very on point and one of the things that i thought was most interesting was the second point which is that um he said roughly paraphrasing um labels and artists uh it doesn't need to be like a middleman relationship anymore 
uh, need to set up royalties so that uh, it's like an 80-20 split in the artist's favor. And mm-hmm. um, I think the the thing about that that I that I'm really fascinated by is I think we are quickly, very rapidly approaching a time in which the major label music industry and the DIY industry will cease to have like a meaningful difference. And it can either be because everything is part of the industrial complex or it can be because everyone is taking uh, their music into their own hands um, as much as possible. So if if we're moving towards a world of potential label obsolescence, um, that 80-20 split is probably going to be like a solid starting space uh, for a lot of artists. And the reason I think the 80-20 split, specifically like those numbers, is so interesting is because when you think about it, um, how do I put this in like terms for the rocket ship emoji Twitter to understand? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Musicians are the workers and the laborers and the record label is what owns the means of production. But since record labels would not have a product without um, the, the musicians and their labor, it would follow that labels taking a majority of the split are being exploitative. An 80-20 split that acknowledges that the, the majority of the labor and the entire reason that the product would exist is in the hands of the musicians um, is would honestly be like pretty revolutionary in the music industry i think i mean an 80 20 split is kind of completely upending the model as it exists it's such a fucked up uh industry that's just always been exploitative i'm I'm trying to remember what it was that like don giovanni posted about because don giovanni ran some excellent threads especially when we had like our music industry like blackout phase Mm -hmm. um and i and i believe that the share that don giovanni posted about was uh maybe a 60 40 split that they were doing and that's something that's like very very um well defined with that label and how they operate and it's also like based on the like amount of sales that they do and the reach that they have and everything that split is what it is just based on don giovanni like kind of recouping i know that joe doesn't make a dime off of don giovanni even with the 60 40 split um how does he operate though like i mean joe's a joe's a communications professor joe's oh shit very very he's not even like a full-time thing okay Mm-hmm. I mean, the label is certainly full time. Um, he's not taking a salary from. Okay. Yeah, I think that eighty twenty for majors is, with the amount of money that major labels are taking in, that to me seems very reasonable, on behalf yeah. of the artist. It's absolutely like the the way that you term it in terms of just workers and their bosses that's how it is that's the the reading for this shit should always be marxist because it's exactly what's going on well you know you know the e word is actually just the m word where it's just all marxist analysis all the time (laughs) yeah i i love a good marxist i tell you what i can't stand the socialists these days (laughs) Shader, <laughs> get off the pot. Fuck, come on. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's crazy that none of the uh, music lawyers out there have really, like, pushed for anything this progressive. But that's just me. Well, I mean, because they benefit from the initial relationship as well, you know? Well, Kanye was also tweeting, like, we need to have contracts rewritten for plain speak. No more of this yes. lawyer talk. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think like the tiny engine stuff, which we don't have to rip this lid off, but like, yeah, (laughs) that's the perfect example of like exploitative shit. Uh, Imagine if the artists were in charge of distributing like mechanical royalties. (laughs) Like, imagine if that was in their court. Mm. Things would change. (laughs) 
tune in to Better Yet on Thursday. Stevie Knipe of Adult Mom. Uh, you yeah, know, that's... Uh, Is it all laid out there? It's all laid <laughs> out pretty well and good. I love Stevie. They're the best. Yeah, that shit, that shit sucked. And that was like a real bummer to see this label that like had a lot of like good records come out on it and then a lot of like very successful records really only used it to just like grow without making like any consideration for well first of all for they grew off of not paying people and it was just like let's get bigger let's get bigger let's get bigger and it's like so what so that like we could get pitchfork reviews like every every time a record comes out like what is that doing what is that like actually doing for a band right now you get a pitchfork review do you sell more records because of that review um i mean uh, i think in times past that would have been true um and like as as a couple people that that we're friends with like miranda have pointed out um you know one of like the the main functions of pr in the past is just to pr and like music journalism reviews has been to you know get you to buy a record spend money on on a product um but you know in in a world where everything is so much more direct and immediate um reviews are kind of just to be part of like an like a like an in-group of of fans at this point like like the reviews are validating for the artist they're not serving like an economic function anymore it's very true very sad because i think that you know you want i think everybody wants that it's like part of i think what we have always used as like what marks success in music is like you know sales and critical recognition and there was like i think that it's become sort of like sales have just gone down and then there's like a criticism industrial complex that's just risen and now it's like those reviews are what get you onto Coachella and onto festivals. And oof, that's not doing anybody too much good right now. Yeah. And I, I say this as someone who's like 100% guilty of feeding into the review economy and the, uh, the think piece economy, you know, like these are, these are things that I think can be used for good, but also like, we're we're just contributing to the noise, you know. Yeah. I, I yes and no, because I think yeah. that like you're, I think that when you're using your voice and you're directing it into like the community that you exist in, you know, if that's if that's your aim, if that's your intention, that's a good thing because like it's gonna reach people who are in those spaces for a particular reason and it's going to help people within there have discussions and hopefully move forward and it's like the the validation it really can come from the people that are just within your community it's the larger like corporate outliers that you know we've all kind of like uh, envied or like idolized and those are the ones that aren't ju- they're not giving anything back they're just like giving crumbs out and then you know someone gets a a 7.0 on pitchfork and they say yay and we say yay and it's like damn okay co- like cool the cool kid at school like said hi to you in the hallway i get it but they're not they're not like doing anything beneficial for like the people that are like actually there and invested yeah 
it's like a um, trophy case that you can point to like mm, for mm -hmm. like booking agents like hey do the you want the industry gatekeepers have smiled upon the yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i think more people are waking up to it like i think that you mean i mean like even people like anthony fantano um like say what you will about him but i think he's like helped contribute to the breaking down of the the pitchfork blogosphere like um empire uh, and the, obviously also, I mean, no disrespect to Ian Cohen, like when we're talking about this, I'm talking about like, you know, that again, that those industry gatekeepers is like an idea because the people who are participating in it on a, participating in it on an individual level are just, you know, they're just trying to do what they love. I think for the most part, it's just like the system is running on autopilot. Yeah. And I think Ian is, is such a is such a gifted writer that he i think ian always like manages to get me to like have an opinion on the things that i read from him even if it's a record review and i think that that's a really strong trait to have and and fantano certainly has it where you're just kind of like man i kind of don't like this guy um but He's always saying things that I like, and even if there are things that I don't, but I guess just like when you when you write in such a way that like you get people to invest an opinion in what they're reading, that's that's just the sign of like a good writer who writes with personality. Mm -hmm. I think that like Ian does a, Ian's done such a great job, and Ian's like made me mad. And, oh yeah, and yeah. I and I <laughs> I look at that, and then I think about like some of the like things that I do on my own podcasts, and I'm like, oh yeah, the the reason that this guy has made me mad is because he's doing exactly what I would be doing <laughs> in that space if I were good yeah. enough to do it. Yeah, hundred percent agreement on that. <laughs> that was a uh, that that was again a very tangential and wide ranging conversation. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I honestly like I I kind of I I know that um I know that Ali's got a deep Kanye fascination and when I saw the topic come up I was I was definitely a little cautious cuz it's been really like tough to I'm not somebody who like really invests too much in like celebrity feelings but and I the fact that he's getting help is a good thing cuz it's very clear that he is in need of assistance with his mental health. It's a bummer to see people like having so much fun at his expense. Yeah, treating it like a punchline. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's also part of like a broader cultural cultural conversation about um, how the media treats the mental health of black men. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I have about eight minutes i think so do we want to dive into dive into heroin let's get really into heroin you guys <laughs> <laughs> i've been really itching for that yeah <laughs> or tim how familiar are you with this situation not one bit okay so this all is right. this is perfect for all the folks at home who are just like me okay okay so washed up emo tweeted about like an old school, old school band that is reuniting, and that uh, you know, like the the publicity needs to like take notice of this because it's like a big deal. Um, and then it was revealed that the band was heroin, um, and he posted like a photo that he had received from somebody else of the entire band together, and it was the first time in like 25 years that everyone in that band has been in the same room. Um, and someone pointed out on the Twitter and the Instagram post that, hey, on Aaron Montaigne's leg, um, who Aaron Montaigne is the drummer of heroin and also the vocalist of Antioch Arrow, um, it kind of looks like he has like a, like a sun wheel, like a black wheel, like a Nazi symbol. Um, and then that was pointed out and Tom immediately took the tweet down because he didn't want to be associated with that whatsoever. Um, but the conversation still raged in Facebook groups. Um, and people were uncovering interviews like Aaron Montaigne, apparently uh, he was uh, in Afghanistan and there's like an interview where he talks about like how thrilling and exhilarating it was to like kill people um, as a soldier. 
Um, and he also had a ring with the sun wheel on it in that interview from like years ago. Uh, and you know, there was just like all this conversation raging and a lot of people like, were just like, Oh, he's a Nazi, like straight up. Like you don't have that tattoo if you're not a fucking white supremacist. Um, and then eventually Aaron like made a response. I don't know how many people saw it, um, but I have a, I screenshot it on my Facebook. Uh, he says, I am totally not a white supremacist. Anyone who knows me knows that I literally like everyone literally. Anyone as, who knows me. <laughs> as some people know, I've been a student of the occult slash black magic for decades, and my tattoo in question is a super old sigil, contrary to whoever wrote the Wikipedia, that was adopted by the alt-right idiots a few years ago. I understand which, that people are looking... What's, what's the uh, symbol, real the quick? The fucking sun wheel, which was invented, like, the style that he has was invented by uh, the fucking Nazis in the 30s. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I understand that people are looking for their neighborhood Nazi, but I'm just an old school Satanist. Um, so if you are anything like me, uh, you also think that this is an extremely whimsy and fleek, exp- well, like flimsy and weak explanation. Um, and the, the, the best thing that I can say about this whole situation is, uh, that I I don't think that the other members of heroin were aware of this considering like how long it has been since, uh, all of them were really in like close contact with each other um but uh, it's it just it's not good but on the other side of that i also have a lot of problems with the people who are just kind of like trying to be revisionists and write both heroin and antioch arrow out of history as if heroin didn't invent screamo and as if antioch arrow isn't the entire reason sass exists that seems like a historical to me mm-hmm. um but yeah, it, it kind of just seems like Aaron Montaigne is uh, is is an edgy boy uh, who got too into like that fucking harsh noise or like neo folk or whatever scene. Um, it has some unfortunate uh, associations because of it, um, and I think that he really needed to do a lot more to uh take accountability for for that shit if he truly is not a white supremacist um but also there is still the 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 very present possibility that he is one <laughs> yeah this the sun wheel is is most certainly a a fucking nazi symbol i actually read a book um during quarantine about uh occult roots of nazism and that was that was definitely one of the ones that came up as just like an invention um, of, you know, something that was probably either stolen from India or Tibet. But yeah, that shit is wild. It's a fascinating world. Um, if anybody is interested in like reading up on uh, the occult and um, I mean, you can find a lot more uh, fun ways to do about it than tying it to Nazism. But Sunwheel, yeah, that's like straight up, that's Heinrich Himmler shit. Yes, yeah. Um, I even like sent a DM to Aaron personally, like, can you please like explain in depth about this? Um, just as someone who has like a huge vested interest in your music, the band Heroin in particular, uh, and as like a Jewish person who has experienced anti Semitism in the music scene, I just would like, uh, and I know a lot of other people would like to hear something like more concrete about this and uh, unread unread message <laughs> mm. well, I, you should have asked you should have asked one of the people who knows him well because they oh, clearly yes. know him. Uh, one of the one of the one of the backed hard good duders yeah uh-huh. yeah <laughs> i also think it was a little sketchy of watch the female to post it take it down and then go silent about it at least distance yourself from it I mean, he there did was, more later on, but I it wasn't. Uh, I think I think his point of view was just that like he didn't want anything to do with it, and uh, but he was did- trying to guilt journalists before anyone knew about it. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that that's also the thing. Just a big old mess. Yeah. How how are you feeling with it as like someone who is, um, you know, attached to the music and in, in all of these ways, and obviously this is uh something that is you know beyond just nazism for all of us but just as a jewish person coming at it from that lens my my thing is you know i have an attachment to that music um and it was made before 
uh, like in all, but by everyone's account, it was made before Aaron started going down that path. And I mean, it's it's one of those things where I can't take that uh, emotional attachment away. And also in my writing, I mean, those bands are continue, going to continue to be like integral, like touchstones and influences uh, that I'm going to have to write about. But, you know, it's uh, one of the band members having iffy, questionable views uh, is going to have to take a place in my larger holistic stand, understanding of the work. So that's that's pretty much how how I feel about it. And that's how I feel about most separate the art from the artist conversations. Like you can't do it. Um, but I, I think that you can incorporate like who those people are into your understanding of the work and kind of analyze how, why you feel about the work, the way that you do uh, with, with that context in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, good. Like good luck. I mean, and I mean that like very, you know, earnestly cause it's, it's really fucking difficult, um, especially with, like, people who choose to go away. It's like, how? Because you you feel so close to them. But I think it's, like, yeah, I think it's, it's tough to unpack for sure. And I think, but I think also, like, one of the things that I've, like, gathered from learning about this type of topic is that like you know at the root of like all um you know it goes in a lot of different directions and it's really easy to like see how one branches off into like something terrible and being able to like look at the very core of like where it all comes from i think it's good to like understand that like yeah like it can go a bad way yeah. Especially with like where we're living right now, like it can go very bad ways. Um, yeah. All right. Big episode uh, turned out to big be. episode. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on, Tim. You fucking rule. Yo, thanks for having me, all. This was this was a lot of fun. I've been looking forward to it all week, and I, I really appreciate y'all taking the time to talk to me. Yeah, this is kind of. A unique episode where there is like structure but there's nothing that there was no through line to it but i think it all was like really really good insightful yeah. fascinating conversation uh, when exactly you work this... with professionals <laughs> <laughs> it's